Hare Krishna everyone, welcome to today's Srimad Bhagavatam class. Today we are reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 11, Chapter 10, Chapter entitled The Nature of Fruitive Activities. Before we start our class, let's do a simple Mangala Charana. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, Narayanam Namaskrityam Naram Chaim Narotamam Deving Saraswatim Vyasam Tato Jem Vidirayat before reciting Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the only means of conquest, let us offer our respectful obeisance to the personality of Godhead, Lord Narayana, onto Nara Narayana Rishi, the supermost human being, onto Mother Saraswati, the goddess of learning, and onto the author, Srila Vyasadev, the author of Srimad Bhagavatam. Nasta Presha, Vdareshu, Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya, Bhagavate Uttama Sloke, Bhaktir Bhavati Nayastagi. By regularly attending Srimad Bhagavatam class and by rendering service to the lotus feet of pure devotees, all that is troublesome to the heart is almost completely vanquished and loving devotional service onto the lotus feet of Lord Sri Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is praised with transcendental songs in choice poetry, is established in one's heart as an irrevocable fact. Om Jnana Timirandasya Jnana Jnana Salakaya Chaksuran Militan Yena Tasmai Sri Guruve Namaha. I was born in a darkness of ignorance, and my spiritual master illuminated my heart with the torch of transcendental knowledge. I offer my respectful obeisance unto him. Nama Om Vishnudaya Krishna Prestai Bhutale Srimite Japataka Swamiti Namne Nama Achara Padai Nitai Kripa Padaini Gora Kadadam Dai Nirgram Tani. Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Sri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vranda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Welcome everybody. Today uh, we are reading from Srimad Bhagavatam Canto 10 Chapter uh, Chapter 10 Sorry Canto 11 Chapter 10 Chapter entitled The Nature of Fruitive Activities before we start our class, let me give you a little bit of uh, introduction to this chapter. This chapter is the continuation of a conversation between Lord Krishna and Uddhava, uh, which is famously known as Uddhava Gita. So, the previous chapter, we heard how Krishna told about a uh, Avadud Brahmana who had 25 gurus, uh, 24 plus 1, 25 gurus. Uh, these gurus actually taught him the principles of uh, liberation and freedom from this material world. So now Krishna is continuing the conversation with uh, Uddhava by telling him more the practical side of applica ap applying these principles. <clears throat> so today's chapter is about the nature of fruitive activities. So the reason why Krishna wanted to start with the, uh, this, type, this uh, subject matter of fruitive activities is because in Kali Yoga, uh, every living entity is convinced due to the influence of, uh, of illusion, uh, maya, that by accumulating lots of money, having more and more material things, one can become happy. So this is the reason why, actually, the reason why. But the fact of the matter is, if you observe the world around you, you will see that despite your belief of acquiring more and more material things, uh, can make you happy despite that of that belief there is so much evidence around you that is that is contrary to 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 this idea so therefore krishna wanted to talk about this fruitive activity so what is this fruitive activities in the first place fruitive activities is any activity that you perform for some material result the result can be money can be your salary bonus allowance for businessmen it can be profit I know for a politician or an entertainer can be name or fame. So these are all fruitive activities. Okay. So so the so these fruitive activities they cover three kinds of people. Basically, Krishna will be talking about in this chapter. Basically, three kinds of three categories of people uh, that involve themselves in fruitive activities. The first kinds are 
the lowest kind is uh, they are called in the category of vikarmis vikarmis are those who are envious of krishna they don't listen to krishna they don't follow any rules and regulation in krishna they simply perform routine activities to simply satisfy their uh, senses they want to enjoy they want to become lords of material nature without uh, accepting krishna or anyone else as an authority their authority that is the lowest kind so basically these are sinful people uh, basically also you can also easily say that this uh, philosophy is um, is uh, what they call is acted out by uh, people from the western culture uh, many in the western world they don't believe in god they think they they are god so they perform activities as if they are god so this is the lowest rung Be- uh, slightly better than these people this group of vikarmis are a group of people called the karma kandis now karma kandis are those people who also work for fruitive activities they also accumulate lots of money but somehow or other these karma kandis they have some reverence and some respect for religious scriptures like the vedas and they have respect for saintly people like brahmanas and sanyasis so these group of people they because of their respect they uh, they take advantage of vedic literatures 99% of vedic literatures are full of procedures of how to acquire uh, what they call material uh, gain material wealth okay so these people they look at the vedas as if it's like a, some kind like a atm machine you do some kind of pro, some kind of uh, uh, follow the procedure uh, perform what they call a uh, homam uh, fire sacrifice and perform it the way it's supposed to be performed and you'll gain some some reward some kind of material opulence so uh, so this is the second kind and then the best kind the best kind of fruitive workers are those who are known as karma yogis so in this connection there is a nice story to connect the karma kandis to uh, how they become karma yogis so the story goes like this there was once a very very rich man who uh, very often he will perform these fire sacrifices uh, to gain all kinds of uh, material wealth and he was a very very rich man so one day he was having this fire sacrifice in his home and so happened uh, it is the culture uh, that whenever you perform such uh, fire sacrifice you will invite brahmanas and uh, sanyasis so one vaishnava guru heard about this and he said let's go and let's let's go and have a look uh, and have uh, some lunch there you know because this is the uh, the secret to uh, performing this fire sacrifice one one secret is at the end of the fire sacrifice one very very long list of names of lord vishnu is recited okay that is the first secret the second secret is at the end of the fire sacrifice food prasadam should be served to brahmanas and sanyasis and then after they have eaten the uh, food is supposed to be served to the pub, to the public so this uh, so happened uh, there, there was one day this uh, uh, vaishnava guru came to this very rich man's house and when this guru reached this rich man's house when the fire sacrifice was being performed he noticed this man's house was so huge it looks like a temple it was like a palace so this guru was thinking how nice if you know if this house can be turned into a temple this one this place can be a center for giving good fortune to everyone in this area so like this um, the guru was thinking and uh, lunch time came everybody sat down the brahmana sat down and the sanyasi sat down this guru also sat down and this uh, rich man he served from his own hand uh, the food to all this uh, brahmanas and this uh, this uh, vaishnavas this uh, vaishnava guru so this rich man noticed this vaishnava guru you know and he was very attracted to him so he decided to go to this vaishnava guru and ask him sir can i do something for you something you know you ask anything i can give you so this vaishnava guru said yes sir i got something i want you to do for me so this vaishnava guru pulled out a small tiny gold pin a tiny gold pin he he gave it to this rich man this uh, this uh, this uh, man you know who was serving him food he gave it to this rich man so this uh, rich man took this tiny pin gold pin and he looked at it and he thought what is what can you do with this gold pin so this rich man asked this vaishnava guru sir what do you want me to do with this uh, gold pin so this vaishnava guru said uh, you please keep this gold pin 
now you, I will collect it from you in my next life. Uh, the guru said that you please keep the pin for me now. I will collect this pin from you in my next life. So this uh, this this rich man, he was holding the pin in his hand. He was puzzled, you know. I said, he said, how am I going to take this small pin with me to my next life? So immediately the Vaishnava guru realized, you know, oh, this this rich man is not a stupid rich man. He's a very intelligent rich man. And he said to him, he said, oh, very good question. Very intelligent question. So this Vaishnava guru started to, uh, to preach to this uh, rich man. He says, this tiny pin like this also you cannot take into your next life. What to speak of your property and your, your gold coins and your, your, your family and your name and your fame. Well, nothing you will take with you into your next life. And then the Vaishnava guru began to explain what is wealth. He says, all that you have now is not wealth. Everything will be taken away from you at the moment of death. You want to have real wealth means you must aim for that wealth of which when you get it, you will never diminish. You will never, you will, you will never be lost. So immediately this rich man, he realized, aha, this is my great opportunity now to learn from a great guru, the art of bhakti yoga. Immediately this man fell at this guru's feet and asked him, please accept me as your disciple. The moment this rich man asked, this uh, Vaishnava Guru to accept him as his, as his disciple, now he is no more a karma kandi. He is no more a person who performs ritualistic ceremony simply to acquire material wealth. Now he's become a karma yogi. He's a yogi. Yogi, why? Because now he has connected himself and everything that he has to a Vaishnava Guru who will teach him the art of how to utilize everything uh, to gain the greatest profit of all, that is love of Godhead, Bhakti Yoga, loving devotional service. So this is the gist of what Krishna is going to talk about. So let's begin now what uh, Krishna says in this chapter. This is text number one. The Supreme Personality of Godhead say, said, Taking full shelter in me with mind carefully fixed in devotional service of the Lord as spoken by me, one should live without personal desire and practice the social and occupational system called Vanash Rama. This is Karma Yoga. This is Karma, uh, this is uh, what they call uh, Vanash Rama. Okay. Text number two. A purified soul should see that because the conditioned soul who are dedicated to sense gratification have falsely accepted the object of the sense pleasure as truth, all of their endeavors are doomed to fail. So this is the conclusion that this, uh, ri this rich man understood when his the Vaishnava guru told him that this is not real wealth. What you have now, your gold coins, your house, your fame, your name, your family, everything, this is not real wealth. Real wealth is that, is that which once you attain, you will never lose. Text number three, one who is sleeping may see many objects of sense gratification in a dream. But such pleasurable things are merely creation of the mind and are thus uselessly useless. Well, and are thus ultimately useless. Ah, this is a very, very important point. One who is sleeping may see many objects of sense gratification in a dream. But such ple pleasurable things are merely creations of the mind and are thus ultimately useless. Similarly, the living entity who is asleep to his spiritual identity also sees many sense objects, but these innumerable objects of temporary gratification are creation of the Lord's illusory potency and have no permanent existence. One who meditates upon them, impelled by the senses, uselessly engages his intelligence. So again, Krishna is emphasizing the point that if you think that gratifying your senses can give you all uh, pleasure and all satisfaction you are actually dreaming this is all a fake this is all illusion text number four one who has fixed me within his mind as the goal of life should give up activities based on sense gratification and should instead execute work governed by the regulative principle for advancement when however one is fully engaged in searching out the ultimate truth of the soul one should not accept the scriptural injunction governing fruitive activities. 
So Krishna is emphasizing here that yes, initially it is good that one is pious. Just like this rich businessman, he was very pious. He was performing all kinds of ritualistic ceremonies to gain some kind of material profit. You know, money, property, a successful business, large families, name, fame, like this. So Krishna is saying here, yes, initially is good. But when one realizes that, uh, uh, you know, uh, such, uh, such regulative principles actually cannot really fully satisfy you, you should give this all up. You should give this karma kanda section of this Veda up. Don't pay any attention to it. In fact, instead you should take to the, um, to the, uh, to the great art of Bhakti Yoga. Okay. This is text number four. Let's go to text number five. One who has accepted me as the supreme goal of life should strictly observe the scriptural injunction forbidding sinful activities and as far as possible should execute the injunction pres prescribing minor regulative duties such as cleanliness. Ultimately, however, one should approach a bonified spiritual master who is full in knowledge of me as I am, who is peaceful and who by spiritual elevation is not different from me. So this is uh, the same advice that Krishna gives in Bhagavad Gita chapter 4, text 34. Tad viti prati patena pari prashena sevaya ubatakshantite jhanam janina tattva darsina. One must try to learn the truth by approaching a spiritual master. Okay. One must inquire from such spiritual master with uh, uh, service and humble inquiry. By inquiring like this, the spiritual master the, the will, will reveal the truth onto the disciple. So this is the point that Krishna is making here. One should eventually, whatever it is, in their lifetime, you should approach a bona fide spiritual master and you should listen and take instruction from such a bona fide spiritual master and try to le learn the art of loving devotional service. This loving devotional service is the great art of re-establishing our loving eternal relationship with Krishna. And we do that through his representative. Just like if we want to have any dealings with United States, we first got to go through the ambassador of the United States in, in Malaysia or any, uh, any, any country. We have to go to go through him first. Then only we can deal with the President of the United States. So similarly, Krishna is saying the same thing here. If you want to approach Krishna, you have to approach Krishna through his bona fide representative, the worthy son. Uh, the worthy son is the spiritual master. A spiritual master is somebody who has dedicated his life. He has sacrificed everything in his life simply to perform activities that are pleasing to Krishna. That is a qualified personality. Let's continue reading text number 6. The servant or disciple of the spiritual master should be free from false prestige, never, never considering himself to be the doer. He should be active and never lazy and should give up all sense of proprietorship over the objects of his senses, including his wife, children, home and society. He should be endowed with feelings of loving friendship towards the spiritual master and should never become uh, become deviated or bewildered. The servant or disciple should always desire advancement in spiritual understanding, should not envy anyone and should always avoid useless conversation. So this is a very power-packed verse here. This one I've, I've, got to, uh, I've got to explain a little bit. Okay, The servant or disciple of the spiritual master should be free from false prestige, and never consider himself to be the doer. So this is actually a very advanced stage. But all of us, we should aspire for this. Huh? We all should understand that um, everything that happens in this material world happens by the sanction of Krishna. This includes also everything that we do with our material body, our human body. We have so much abilities. So these abilities are given to us by Krishna. Everything happens because he... Uh, he uh, sanctions it. Okay, So we should understand that everything happens uh, by Krishna's sanction. Krishna is the one who sanctions everything, good or bad, in this, in this material world. So with, without having any false prestige, any false ego, false ego here means that 
uh, you think that, oh, I am the one who did this, I am the one who achieved this, I am the one who uh, who created this situation, oh, I am I'm very happy today because of my uh, endeavors, I shall grow even more in the future, anybody coming in my way, I will destroy them, you know, this is the this is the worst kind of false ego, thinking that I am the doer. Actually, that's not the case at all. We are only one ingredient in, uh, in uh, what do you call, uh, uh, five elements that is needed for something to happen. If you want to know more about this, go to chapter 18, text 14 of Bhagavad Gita. You read that, that translation, then you will understand. Okay. He should be active and never lazy and should give up all sense of proprietorship over the object of the senses, including his wife, children, home and society. So this is this is a characteristic of somebody who is very spiritually advanced. First of all, somebody who is spiritually advanced realizes that they are not this body. Uh, they are eternal spirit soul. And everyone else around them are also eternal spirit soul that is intimately related to Krishna. So therefore, if you can understand this, then you will understand that such a devotee will see everything around him in relation to Krishna only. Even his own wife, the wife will see the husband also as intimately related to Krishna. The, the, both the father and the mother will see the children, the home, the society, the family members, their wealth, their property, everything in relation to Krishna. So, by, by seeing everything in this light, what they will do is, they will try to engage everything in the service of the Supreme Lord. To explain further, let's take the, let's take the example of this rich man. After surrendering to, his, to this Vaishnava Guru, the Guru told him, he says, your, please turn your, your big uh, palatial house into a temple by installing deities in the temple. So by simply installing deities in the temple, what happens is the whole family is engaged in serving the deities of, uh, let's say, Gornitai or Radha Krishna or Sita Ram or Lakshmi Narayana or uh, Lord Narasimha. So many uh, authorized deities are there. But of course, we, we Gaudiya Vaishnavas, we recommend everyone to have deities of Gornitai. Why? Because they are the most merciful incarnation of Krishna. Okay. Simply by installing such a deity in one's home, immediately everybody in the family is engaged in serving the deities of the family. And by simply doing that, everybody is guaranteed of liberation. Everybody who has anything to do with the deities of Radha Krishna, who is serving in some way or other, every single living entity, I won't even say human beings, every single living entity their liberation from this cycle of birth and death in this material world is guaranteed. You see? So this is the wonderful uh, side effect of actually of Bhakti Yoga. He should be endowed with feeling of loving friendship towards the spiritual master and should never become deviated or bewildered. This, this one is a very, very uh, sweet verse actually. Sweet point here. It says here that one should be very... Uh, very intimate, very uh, very close to one's spiritual master. Why? Some people ask me, why why do we need to be so close to our spiritual spiritual master? So the simple answer to that is actually found in ba uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto One, Chapter One, uh, Text Number One. If you read that, you'll you'll uh, you'll uh, understand this point. In our whole lives, uh, probably the person that is most uh, uh, our greatest well-wisher is our parents, the greatest. Everyone else is simply trying to exploit you only. Everyone else, most most of 99.9% uh, .9 of everybody you meet in your life, besides your parents, they just want to simply exploit you for their own gain. Okay? The only There's only one person besides your parents that is not interested in exploiting you in any shape, way or form. And that is called a spiritual master. The spiritual master is the true well-wisher of everyone. They are the well-wisher of every living entity. So therefore, if you can understand that a spiritual master, he is the well-wisher for you, we should understand that we should not treat the spiritual master as if it's like some, some boyfriend we can take advantage of. That is not the correct understanding. I've seen this happen over and over again. They treat the spiritual master as if he's, he's, he's their girlfriend. 
you know all the trouble all the nonsense in their head in their heart everything they will dump on the spiritual um, spiritual master that is not the right thing to do one should have a relationship with the spiritual master as if huh, the spiritual master is like is like the greatest personality in the whole universe actually he is the greatest personality in the whole universe because for you he represents krishna the supreme personality of godhead so just like how you treat a king or a very very important person you should treat your spiritual master like that also but the spiritual master being very merciful he doesn't like to show his uh, what what they call his uh, his uh, what they call false ego you know like some some very powerful people they will act, they act very e- very egotistical spiritual masters they are not like that they are very soft hearted they are very kind you know so because of their kindness sometimes the disciple misunderstand the spiritual master and think uh, that the spiritual master is not different than his uh, his macha his friend no that is that is wrong huh? so he says here by having a intimate relationship with the spiritual master the spiritual master will bless the disciple so that the disciple whether he he, he becomes a pure devotee or not he is he is what he call his liberation from his in this world of repeated birth and that is guaranteed so that is the reason why we should have a intimate relationship with our spiritual master the servant or disciple should always desire advancement in spiritual understanding and should not envy anyone and should always avoid useless conversation a sincere devotee should be very very eager whenever the spiritual master is around physically or he gives instruction and he should only engage himself in glorifying his spiritual master number 1 in glorifying krishna number 2 in trying to help others to uh, practice krishna consciousness try to engage them in a non envious way non envious way here means that you don't criticize them so in uh, bhagavad gita krishna says that one should not disturbs another person's faith whatever the faith might be instead one should employ them in some way or other employ them in engage them in some krishna conscious activity and we should always avoid talking nonsense because nonsense is a waste of time and waste of breath so this is the gist of this this text here text number 7 one should see one's real self interest in life in all circumstances and should therefore remain detached from wife children home land rela- relative friends wealth and so on here he says that one should uh, see everything in relation to krishna you should never at any point think that oh my wife is my property or my children is my property or this house is this car this money is mine that is quite it's a very dangerous mentality to have why because the moment you think like that then uh, when you fall sick that idea is challenged and it will disturb you very very much when you become old this idea is put to the test again and then you become even more disturbed and when death approaches you you will be supremely disturbed so why you want to ask uh, ask for trouble like this better just don't accept this idea that everything belongs to me why because certain the the only certain thing in in, li- in life is death death means you have to give up everything by force so don't accept ev- anything as in a false mood in the first place see everything in relation to krishna try to engage everything for krishna's pleasure for the guru's uh, guru's follow guru's instruction text number 8 just as fire which burns and illuminates is different from firewood which is to be burnt to give illumination similarly the seer within the body the self enlightened spirit soul is different from material body which is to be illuminated by consciousness thus the spirit soul and the body possesses different characteristics and are separate entities so here krishna is emphasizing the same fact he is telling you that my friend you are not your material body no matter what you think you are not this material body you are the eternal spirit soul uh by accepting the idea that you are in a material body you are demoting yourself you are demeaning yourself you are putting yourself in a lower understanding in fact if you accept the fact that you are eternal spirit soul what happens is you become extremely happy extremely free you become uh relieved of all the 
uh, unnecessary distresses of this material world. You see everything in this proper light. Nothing would bewilder you. Okay. Let's go to text number nine. Just as fire may appear differently or dormant, manifest weak, brilliant, and so on, according to the condition of a fuel. Similarly, the spirit soul enters a material body and accepts particular bodily characteristics. So, if you enter a male, uh, the spirit soul enter male body, you'll be you'll behave like a male, uh, exactly just like a, a actor on a stage. Whatever costume the actor wears, he's got to act accordingly. <laughs> So that's what this verse is saying. Whatever body you get, you will act accordingly. So don't think that you are your body. Because every time you take birth, you will get a different body. There's no guarantee you will get the same body in your next life. This life, my body here is that of a male, a man. My next life, I do not know what kind of body I will get. I can get a female body. I can get an animal body. I can get a deva body. I can get an asura body. I can get a demon body. I can get any kind. Like there's 8,400,000 species of life. I can get any one of them. So don't be too attached to your body right now. Text number 10. The subtle and gross material bodies are created by material modes of nature, which expands from the potency of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Material existence occur when the living entity falsely accepts the qualities of the gross and subtle bodies as being his own factual nature. This illusory state, however, can be destroyed by real knowledge. So all discovering actually can be very bewildering. Uh, you, first of all, we have to understand that whatever we have acquired through multiple lifetimes, unlimited number of lifetimes we have taken in the past, we have acquired some kind of habits. And these habits in Sanskrit, it is called vasanas. You know, vasanas means past life impressions. Sometimes you will meet someone, you, he has a certain kind of habit, you know, and, and uh, um, uh, if you meet old people, sometimes these, these habits will remind them of someone in their past, in their, in their, in their, in their what they call, in their younger days. So that person they are seeing with this character might be the same Atma, but different body. So we have to understand that, you know, to, um, to overcome this these bad habits based on illusion, how to overcome it, we need to take shelter of transcendental knowledge. That is called real knowledge. Uh, in this verse, it is stated here, real knowledge. Only real knowledge can help you to get out of the, uh, the illusory effect of this material world, having material body and, and uh, being illusion. We commit all kinds of sinful activities and these sinful activities will become the seed of our next body. So to escape from the cycle, you need to, first of all, take shelter of transcendental knowledge. Transcendental knowledge comes from Bhagavad Gita as it is and from Srimad Bhagavatam. First, you must understand what is what is stated by Krishna in Bhagavad Gita and what is stated by Sukadeva Goswami in Srimad Bhagavatam. Once you understand this, then you will understand why is it so important to take shelter of a spiritual master. Spiritual master is the one who can guide you. You see, spiritual master is like the spiritual doctor. Just like if you go to general hospital, you see a doctor there. The doctor will diagnose you and find out what is your sickness. And according to his diagnosis, he will give you a certain kind of medicine that is meant only for you. Okay, to help you recover from your sickness. So similarly, the spiritual master is exactly like this medical doctor. The spiritual master will diagnose you. He will find out what is your situation. And he will advise you accordingly so that the advice that is given to you actually meant for you only. You should just do this. You should follow his instruction. And by following his instruction, you will be relieved of all these bad habits, these vasanas that has uh, entrapped you in this cycle of birth and death. Okay. So let's go to text number 10. The subtle and gross material bodies are created by material modes of nature which expands from the potency of the supreme oh sorry so i read already text number 10 text number 11 therefore by the cultivation of knowledge one should approach the supreme personality of godhead situated within oneself by understanding the lord's pure transcendental existence one should gradually give up the false vision of the material world as independent reality <clears throat> the independent reality here means that uh, we all think being under illusion we think that 
or oh, i am separate from uh, god or oh, i am separate from uh, this uh, this material nature you know uh, uh, what i want to do got nothing to do with god is only got to do with me my desire got nothing to do with with anyone else no that is not true nothing is in nothing in this world is independent of of krishna everything that you see around you this material world from the building to the road to the tree to the sky all of it is expansions of krishna's energy all of it including you also we are all part of parcel of krishna eternal part and parcel of of krishna so therefore you should never make the mistake of seeing anything independent of krishna text number 12 the spiritual master can be compared to the lower kindling stick and the disciple to the upper kindling stick and the instruction given by the guru to the to the third stick place in between the transcendental knowledge communicated from guru to disciple is compared to the fire arising from the contact of these which burns the darkness of ignorance to ashes bringing great happiness both to guru and disciple so here is a very wonderful uh, description of the relationship between guru and disciple the guru imparts such knowledge onto the disciple that the, the disciple simply hearing it he feels great joy in his heart this guru seeing the joy in the disciple's heart the guru becomes also even more joyful so this is such a wonderful relationship this is text number 13 by submissively hearing from an expert spiritual master the expert disciples develop pure knowledge which repels the onslaught of material illusion arising from the three modes of material nature finally this pure knowledge itself ceases just as fire ceases when the stock of fuel has been consumed here uh, this uh, uh, krishna is telling uddhava that once when you start practicing this devotional service you will ask yourself what have i been doing before this this devotional service is so sweet and is so potent it is so engrossing i so wonderful what have i been doing before this i must have been a crazy person you see this is what his verse is saying finally the pure knowledge itself ceases just as fire ceases when the stock of fuel has been consumed when you when you practice such devotional service you will forget about all the pains and all the uh, all the distresses and the anxiety of this of this material world in fact there are many many stories of devotees who perform devotional uh, service with such determination and such engrossed content, uh, concentration that they did not even know that they have left their body they left the body the material body which is actually supposed to be a very crucially very painful experience they left it they 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 don't know they don't know this is how engrossing it can be so this is what you can look forward to uh, with the uh, devotional service uh, you know, as a point of reference you can read canto 1 there's a story by narada muni you can read there what happened to him this exactly happened to him he changed body from one body to another without even experiencing death so this is this this can be your experience so at uh, this section from chap- text 14 until uh, text uh, 34 krishna uh, will be talking about this materialistic uh, mentality of uh, of this material world here he is talking about one uh, one uh, philosopher by the name of jaimini this jaimini came up with a philosophy that says that the purpose of life is to work hard perform um, your duty acquire lots of material assets uh, and after acquiring such material uh, assets perform some charity activity collect enough uh, pious merits to go to the heavens and enjoy superior material life with the devas that is the purpose of material life there is no other purpose to it there is no vaikuntha there is no god there is nothing so this is the philosophy of jaimini which is actually the philosophy of this material world the materialistic culture that we are living in now is exactly that jaimini so now krishna is going to talk about this philosophy and he is going to give reasons why this philosophy is very 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 dangerous we should reject it okay this is text number 14 to 16 my dear udava i have thus explained to you perfect knowledge there are philosophers however who challenge my conclusion 
they state that the natural position of the living entity is to engage in fruitive activities and they see him as the enjoyer of the happiness and unhappiness that occurs from his own work. According to this materialistic philosophy, the world, time, the revealed scriptures and the self are all variegated and eternal, existing as a perpetual flow of transformation. Knowledge, moreover, cannot be one or eternal because it arises from the different and changing forms of objects. Thus, knowledge itself is always sub subject to change. Even if you accept such a philosophy, my dear Uddhava, there will still be perpetual birth, death, old age and disease, since all living entities must accept a material subject, material body subject to the influence of time. So Krishna, in, 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 uh, in conclusion to this verse here, to this explanation here, he says that whether you accept this philosophy or whether you don't accept this philosophy, one fact will, ne will, will never change, which is at the end of your life, there will there, uh, be old age, disease and death. And then again, you have to take birth again in this material world. Since you love this material world so much, you'll come back again and you've got to experience it all over again. You see? So this is the danger of this kind of philosophy. So let's go to text number 17. Although the performer of fruitive activities desire perpetual happiness, it is clearly observed that materialistic workers are often unhappy and only occasionally satisfied, thus proving that they are not independent or in control of their destiny. When a person is always under the superior control of others, how can he expect any value, valuable results from his own fruitive actions? Text number 18. It is observed within the material world that sometimes even an intelligent person is not happy. Similarly, sometimes even a great fool is happy. The concept of becoming happy through expert Expertly performing material activities is simply a useless exhibition of false egoism. Oh, I am better than you. You are better than me. Let me challenge you. Text number 19. Even if people know how to achieve happiness and avoid unhappiness, they still do not know the process by which death will not be able to exert its power over them. That, that knowledge is actually called Bhakti Yoga. Text number 20. Death is not at all pleasing and since everyone is exactly like a condemned man being led to the place of execution, what possible happiness can people derive from material objects or the gratification they provide? Text number 21. That material happiness of which we hear, such as promotion to the heavenly planets for celestial enjoyment, is just like the material happiness we have already experienced. Both are polluted by jealousy, envy, decay and death. Therefore, just as an, an attempt to arise crops before fruitless therefore just as an attempt to raise crops become fruitless if there are many problems like crop disease, insects, plagues or drought. Similarly, the attempts to attain material happiness either on earth or on heavenly planets is always fruitless because of innumerable obstacles. Please understand this material world from the heavenly planets down to the hellish worlds is a place of repeated birth and death. Uh, there is no escaping this in this material world. So what is the point of you know, uh, or over endeavoring for mundane material achievements? It's simply a waste of effort. Text number 22. If one performs Vedic sacrifices and fruitive rituals without any mistake or contamination, one will achieve a heavenly situation in the next life. But even this result, which is only achieved by perfect performance of fruitive rituals, will be vanquished by time. Now hear of this. Text number 23. If on earth one performs sacrifice for the satisfaction of the demigods, he goes to the heavenly planets where just like a demigod he enjoys all the heavenly pleasures he has earned by his performance. 
text number 24 having achieved the heavenly planets the performer of ritualistic sacrifices travels in a glowing airplane which he obtains as the results of his piety on earth being glorified by songs sung by gandharvas and dressed in wonderful charming clothes he enjoys life surrounded by heavenly goddesses text number 25 accompanied by heavenly women the enjoyer of the fruits of sacrifice goes on pleasure rides in wonderful airplanes which is decorated with circles of tinkling bells and which flies wherever he desires being relaxed and comfortable and happy in the heavenly pleasure pleasure gardens he does not consider that he is exhausting the fruits of his piety and will soon fall down to the mortal world text number 26 until his pious results are used up the performer of sacrifices enjoys life in the heavenly planets when the pious results are exhausted however he falls down from the pleasure gardens of heaven being moved again against his desire by the force of eternal time text 27 to 29 <clears throat> if a human being is engaged in sinful irreligious activities either because of bad association or because of his failure to control his senses then such a person will certainly develop a personality full of material desires he thus becomes miserly towards others greedy and always anxious to exploit the body of women when the mind is so polluted one becomes violent and aggressive and without the authority of vedic injunction slaughter innocent animals for sense gratification worshipping ghost and spirit the bewildered person falls fully into the grip of unauthorized activities and thus goes to hell where he receives a material body infected by the darkest mode of nature in such a degraded body he unfortunately continues to perform inauspicious activities that greatly increase his further unhappiness and therefore he again accepts a similar material body what possible happiness can there be for one who engages in activities inevitably terminating in death text number 30 in all the planetary system from the heavenly to the hellish and from all the great demigods who live for 1000 yuga cycles there is fear of me in my form of time even brahma who possesses the supreme lifespan of 311 trillion 40 billion years is also afraid of me in the form of time of and of death text number 31 the material senses create material activities either pious or sinful and the modes of nature sets the material senses into motion the living entity is being fully engaged by the material senses and modes of nature experience the various results of fruitive work text number 32 as long as the living entity thinks that the mode of material nature have separated existence he will be obliged to take birth in many different forms and will experience varieties of material existence therefore the living entity remain completely dependent on the fruitive activities under the mode of nature text number 33 the conditioned soul who remain dependent on fruitive activities under the material modes of material nature will continue to fear me the supreme personality of godhead since i impose the results of one's fruitive activities those who accept the material concept of life taking the very goodness of modes of nature to be factual devote themselves to material enjoyment and are therefore always absorbed in lamentation and grief text number 34 when there is agitation and interaction of the material modes of nature the living entity then describe me in various ways such as all powerful time the self vedic knowledge the universe one's own nature religious ceremonies and so on so this is the uh, advice given by krishna to uddhava as to why it's a bad very 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 bad idea 
to take shelter of the idea that you are the enjoyer and the goal of life is simply to work hard to acquire lots of material assets and to acquire some kind of pious activities, get, get some pious merit to go to heavenly planets. Why? Because at the ultimate end is you will fall down into this material world. When your pious merit is finished, you come back 2.0 again in this earth again. So in this connection, there is a very nice story to, to, uh, to illustrate you know, how wonderful devotional service can be. Okay? So this story is about one king who one day who desired a son. So he tried many, many times to have a, a son, you know. So one day his wife gave birth to a baby boy. He was, this king was so happy. He was so happy that he wanted to give in charity. So he gave in charity to, uh, to everyone that came to the palace to meet him. And he especially gave to brahmanas and, uh, and saintly people, uh, gurus, sannyasis. So he gave, anybody came, he gave. The, his citizens came to see him, also he gave in charity. He gave, 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 gave. And then in the end, everybody was satisfied. So he turned to his servants in his palace. He asked, anybody want anything? Please come and ask, I'll give. So all the servants came. Everybody asked, oh, sir, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. And he gave everybody. But he, this king had one servant by the name of Das, Gopal Das. Uh, he used to call him Das. Uh. So this Das never asked the king for anything. And the king noticed. He, 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 uh, he went to this Das, this king, went to this Das and asked, He said, Das, why didn't you ask me for anything? You will please ask me, I will give you. So this Das will give you same, he will give the same reply to the king. Say, my dear king, I don't want anything. I am fully satisfied. Why? Because I am serving under a great king like you, a great saintly king like you. My heart is fully satisfied. So the king hearing this reply, he is very happy. But at the same time, also he is saying this, this Das, eh, I am sure he needs, he wants something on. I must try to find out. So every day this king will ask this Das, hey, you want anything? Please ask me, I will give you, don't fear, I will give you something. So this Das will give the same answer, no sir, I don't need anything, I am very happy serving under you. So again, he will ask again, every day he will ask, hey, please ask me, please ask me, please ask me. So one day the king got a bit, got, got a bit frustrated, no? So he went to this Das, cornered him and he says, I am not going to let you go until you tell me something that you want. I cannot sleep at night until I give you something. You know, this is how much love the king had for this, uh, this uh, servant of his by the name of Das. So in the end, this Das was cracking. He said, so what can I ask? I don't want, I don't need anything. So suddenly this Das got an idea. He said, oh, I, I got one. Uh, I got an idea of what to ask the king. So finally he told the king, my dear king, as you know, I'm very happy, I'm very satisfied, I'm so, I'm so satisfied, I don't need anything. But on behalf of my wife and my children, can I please ask you to bless me with your presence in my house to come for lunch? So the king heard this and he started laughing. He said, that's all you want. Hey, hello friend, I can give you great riches. I have so much wealth. You don't want any wealth. He said, the Das looked at the king and he said, my dear king, what am I going to do with all this wealth? Wealth all is meant for you. You know how to utilize it. I do not know what to do with this wealth. But if you can come to my house for lunch, I'll be very happy. My family will be blessed. My children will be blessed. My home will be blessed. So you please come for lunch. So the king being very, very charmed and very happy to hear this, he said, of course I'll come to your house for lunch. No problem. So when the king said yes to Das's uh, invitation for lunch in his house, this king's wife heard. I said, hey, you're going alone to this Das's house for lunch. I cannot, cannot, cannot. We also want to go with you. So this king had 100 wives. All the wives wanted to go to Das's house for lunch. So they say, okay, all the wives also want to go to uh, the, the, this uh, Das's house for lunch. And then when they realized that all the queens want to go and the king want to go, the prime minister said, how can I let you go alone? This is, where, this is not proper. You must go with your bodyguards and your army and all that. So the king said, okay, la, what to do? If you say so, then you please make arrangement. So the prime minister realized that this Das's home is just a small hut. How can all these queens and the king go into this hut and eat? It's not going to work. 
So the Prime Minister decided, okay, because of this one uh, uh, occasion, he is going to build a small palace next to the hut of this Das. So that all the queens will be comfortable, the king will be comfortable, the ministers will be comfortable, the, the, the bodyguard, everything will be comfortable. So they built a big palace and this was like a holiday uh, palace for the, uh, the king and his queens. So the, 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 the day came. Uh, the day came. So the king went to Das's house. The, first the king went into his hut. He saw the hut. He saw it was a very humble hut. Not even a house. It's a hut. And the wife was there. The children were there. They were so happy to see the king. They, they, they asked the king to sit down. And they started feeding the king. And then after that, uh, because the queens were there, the wife took the cooking to the palace to feed the wife. So after feeding the wife, the Das came to feed the minister. After feeding the minister, he fed the soldiers. After everybody was happy, everybody was fed, everybody was satisfied, you know, the king came and said thank you to Das and his wife and his children and they all went back. So after everybody left, Das and his wife and his children were just sitting there. They were so happy. They were so joyful. Suddenly they realized, hey, next door to us is a palace. Who is going to take care of the palace? So they asked the, the prime minister. He says, my dear prime minister, you have a big palace there. Who is going to take care of it? And he said, the prime minister said, that palace is actually meant for you. The king told, you build the palace. After we use the palace, you ask Das and his family to live there. He is now the caretaker of the palace. So finally, the king got to give Das something. So devotional service, loving devotional service to Krishna is like this. We don't have to ask Krishna anything. Simply by rendering loving devotional service to Krishna, Krishna will provide all that we have in our, des in our desire in, in our heart. He will fulfill all our desires. Just like how this king knew that this Das is so humble, he will never ask for anything. But because the king was so loving, he wanted to give his most dear servant something and he gave him a nice palace. Whereby he told him, he said, no, 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 you become the caretaker. You got to stay in the palace to become caretaker. But actually who enjoys the palace? Actually the caretaker is the one who enjoys the palace. So like this, loving devotional service to Sri Krishna is so wonderful. You don't have to think of any desire. Krishna will fulfill all your desires, provided that you follow Krishna's instruction stated in uh, Bhagavad Gita and in Srimad Bhagavatam. So I'll end the class here. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.